Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Mac Voices Magazine, our free Flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it seems like for some reason there's a lot of interest in Apple by filmmakers of various kinds. We've had some filmmakers on that talked about the Newton. We've had filmmakers on that talked about Apple itself. This time, I'm really excited to welcome Brad Olson uh, to the show. He is the the maker, the director, producer, I'm not, he probably, I think he wears all the hats, um, of a documentary called Off the Tracks about Final Cut 10. Brad, first of all, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. It's really fun to be here. I saw you present, uh, sort of before it was released, uh, some clips of Off the Tracks at the Super Meet in April in, uh, in Las Vegas at NAB. And was really intrigued, and and I decided I better wait and to get you on the show until it was actually out in the wild. So after the interview, people can go and watch it instead of just being teased and maybe forget about it. What what you showed I thought was very intriguing, um, but I want to take us the whole way back to the beginning and ask what is off the tracks and why did you decide to produce it. <laughs> Those are some big questions. Uh, off the Tracks, like you said, is a documentary that talks about Final Cut Pro 10. Um, you know, there was a, a controversial rollout of this software, probably one of the most controversial roll, rollouts of any Apple software. And a lot of professional users uh, that had been using uh, editing with earlier versions of Final Cut were not fans of what Apple had done they felt like the rug was pulled out from underneath them and it just felt like everyone kind of abandoned Final Cut Pro 10 in 2011 and uh, at the same time I saw a new application that I thought looked really amazing and I thought they were doing the right thing so I stuck with it I was one of the few crazy people who stuck with it and over the years we've seen them make improvements to the software upgrade it update it and then uh, you know, now there there's numbers out there of there being over 3 million uh, downloads of the software. So by far the most professional, or the most widely used professional video editing software. So to me, it was kind of this ultimate comeback story and off the tracks being somewhat of a pun because um, they got rid of video and audio tracks and replaced it with this thing called the magnetic timeline. Um so, you know, they went off the tracks, so to speak. So I remember that rollout because I was in the process of trying to learn, what was it, Final Cut 7, I guess, at that point. Mm-hmm. And I'd gotten, uh, you know, I'd, I, I was in a little bit deeper than my toe. I probably had about half my leg in. And it was, you could definitely see the power, but trying to learn how to how to bring it to your will it, it it reminded me so much of of things like maybe a, some of the Adobe Photoshop software and those kind of things that you can do amazing things with it, but you have to invest an awful lot of time. And when Final Cut 10 came out, and admittedly I'm not a filmmaker, but when Final Cut 10 came out, for me I didn't have a lot of those ingrained habits, so I didn't I didn't have as as much to unlearn, and so much of it just in a very short time made sense to me. It's probably the reason I'm doing video now is because it became so easy compared to Final Cut 7. Right. I think it's what Apple has been known for from the very beginning. If you look at the original Macintosh and you look at the the dream of desktop publishing on the Mac, that, that to me is what Apple's about. Something that used to take it was really complicated, took a lot of people um, a lot of time to do, Apple finds ways of simplifying it and making it accessible to the common man. Now that might upset certain people who've spent a lot of time dedicated to learning something, spending a lot of money and investment on, on something, you know, an older system. But I think it benefits so many people to be able to get their 
voice out there and be able to try something that they thought before was not accessible to them. And that, that to me is, I mean, that's a big message in my film is that um, the, the democratization of video is a vital thing for our society to move forward uh, because that's how, you know, younger kids growing up now are communicating through video. So they need to, just like we learn word processing and we learn how to read and write, um, the spoken and the written word, I think it's just as important that we start learning the video language as well. Even if you're not going to be Steven Spielberg, it's still a necessary thing. And I, and I, and Apple bet on that in 2011. And I think they, they were right. I mean, right now you can look at, uh, this week, Adobe announced premiere rush, which is their kind of re, do of an editing software it's basically targeted towards youtubers and and beginners and whatnot and it looks an awful lot like the ideas that are in final cup of 10 it's got a magnetic timeline they're taking a lot of ideas that um, Apple came up with for final cut pro 10 and recognizing that the next generation is going to have a much easier time learning these paradigms and moving forward this is the way things are going so Apple is actually not alone now in this <laughs> this race to uh, to educate the world in in video editing. The democratization of video is such a is such a kind of a buzz phrase, but it's absolutely true that it's something that we're, we're doing more and more of. Uh, I mean, of of all the entities, Facebook is encouraging it because you know you can go live with anything anywhere, you know, and 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 some people would say share it. Some people might say pollute the timeline. You know, there are a lot of, <laughs> a lot of different phrase, phrases and views on it. Back then, when you said you, you know, you decided to stick with it, and at that, what were you doing at that time? Were you heavily involved with Final Cut Seven? Yeah. So, I mean, if we go back a little bit, um, when I was one of the first editing software I learned was in the late '90s. I learned Adobe Premiere version four. And then I did an internship when I was about 16, and, and this gives you my age, but a uh, pretty young guy here. Uh, 2001, I was 16, and I did an internship at a, a facility where they had Avid. And Avid really impressed me because they let me cut a f- couple short films on the system, and it just it worked really, really well compared to the home-built PC that kept crashing and having issues with Premiere. And then... I found out that that Avid cost $100,000 and that they didn't actually own it. They rented it. And that kind of made my heart sink because, you know, I want to make movies. That's what I wanted to do. So <laughs> Final Cut Classic was out around then. We call it Classic or Legacy or whatever you want to call it. Um, and and pretty soon, by like I think about 2003, I was uh, just full on uh, in, in on Final Cut Pro because it could do everything I wanted. But if we go forward a few more years, in 2008, Apple redid iMovie. And that was a bit of a controversy as well because iMovie 08 was a completely new application and couldn't do all the things that iMovie 06 could do. But there were some new innovations and some new ideas in that. And one story in particular stood out to me that Steve Jobs told where he said, hey, we had one of our engineers um, come up with this new software. He came back from a scuba diving trip and had a bunch of underwater footage and, and wanted to select the shots of the sharks. But, you know, just you're just rolling for a long time and it's just blue you know, blue, 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 blue everywhere. And you finally find the shark and he he found the existing tools were not good enough. So, um, so he came up with this idea of film strips and this idea of a skimmer where you could just skim across your footage and find what you're looking for and select a range, like you're copying and pasting text. And that like Steve Jobs saw him demo the software and uh, and said, this is going to be the new iMovie. And that engineer actually happens to be Randy Ubilos, who in the 90s invented Premiere and, and then went to work for Apple on Final Cut Pro and then created the new iMovie. So I felt like in, by 2008 that this was 
obviously the direction that Apple would have to go with their new software. I didn't realize that the rest of the video industry was not paying attention to that. And by this point, my career was um, starting to edit independent films. I was doing a lot of corporate videos. I was putting a lot of stuff up on YouTube. And I was pretty well versed in Final Cut Pro 6 and then 7, which came out in 2009. But I felt like when in 2009 that that Final Cut 7 wasn't the right thing because it was still 32-bit. It was still the old paradigms, the old way of, of doing things. And I felt like all the cameras that we were using were changing from tape to memory cards. So it seemed to me that we needed an editing application that responded to that. And to, so for me, I was primed in 2011 to, to see that software came out, come out. Now, I acknowledge that it was a little bit more of a beta release than I would have liked. And it was missing a lot of things that I had grown used to in Final Cut 7. But I was also pretty confident that Apple would, um, if they were, if they were allowed to, if it was, if the uproar wasn't so, so bad that they decided to just give up, I figured if they kept going with this, that it would be a robust piece of software. So that's kind of my history and, and why it wasn't as shocking or as a big of a big deal to me but then in making the documentary i got to talk to a lot of people and and really figure out why it was such a big deal to them um which is something that previously i didn't completely understand it's, it takes a lot of courage i would think to do what apple did and apple's done it a couple times as you said with final cut with imovie um with uh, with uh keynote with numbers, um, with pages, you know, they've, they've had to take a step back in order to take a bigger step forward at some point. And if that bigger step forward doesn't happen right away, people get really upset because you're, you're messing with things in the case of final cut that they make their living with. Um, so I, I could understand how they were upset, but it does seem a little bit at, at times, from a distance, it seemed to me it was a little bit short-sighted because so many of these people were just saying, no, we're, we're sticking with Final Cut Classic, to your, to your point. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's the way it's always going to be, and that's what we know. And, you know, it's like saying, okay, I'm going to take a 1960s Indianapolis car out, you know, in the, in the 2018 Indy 500. It's like, yeah, okay, you can do it, but you're going to get your doors blown off. You mm-hmm. know? So, so now it feels like final cut really has evolved to the point that, and, 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 and people started to get it. Walter, I saw Walter Murch speak at, uh, at another super meet and he talked about his evolution into final cut and how he came to realize what, how powerful it was. But I, I, I want to I want to take us now to the point where you decided, okay, this is a story to tell. You're a storyteller, and you're going to tell a story about one of the tools that you use. What? Why? It's <laughs> <laughs> a great question. Yeah. Um, basically, there was a couple factors, and I, I liked uh, the story. I like to tell is it, it actually first started creeping up in about 2015. You know, it was 2015. I was approached uh, by a friend of mine who was a producer to edit a local independent film. It was about a million dollar budget. And he knew I edited and and he was looking to hire me. Uh, The co-producer on the film happened to not like Final Cut Pro 10. So when he heard that I was editing with Final Cut Pro 10, he actually recommended that I not be hired simply based off of my preference for editing software. And that really frustrated me. And I, I, you know, I, I, I had a few words with him, not super heated, but I was, I was definitely frustrated and trying to convince him that no Final Cut Pro 10 is a professional tool. By this point, it had been used on two uh, Hollywood feature films, uh, Focus and Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. So I felt like it had proven itself that it could be used on any, any type of project and certainly an independent film. And After that event, um, I saw the Final Cut Pro 10 community starting to uh, come together and meet uh, at NAB specifically. There was this meetup called the FCP Exchange. And then, of course, there's the Super Meet, which you've mentioned. And I I saw the players in this community. I I wanted to 
I kind of wanted in. I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be, you know, maybe considered some sort of thought leader or something in this kind of field of, of people who were pushing Final Cut Pro 10 and evangelizing it. And as I saw that everybody kind of had this common story and this experience of the hurt of the launch of Final Cut Pro 10 and, and what it did to them and how Final Cut Pro 10 was coming back, uh, I thought that's, that's a story and somebody should make a documentary. Somebody should take all of these podcasts and all of this information that's out there on blog sites and everything and, and coalesce it, like um, curate it and put it into one definitive documentary. And that's where it started. So I approached uh, Sam Messman, who uh, has been a leader in the Final Cut community, and he knew everybody. And I'd introduced myself to him and I said, hey, I really want to do this. And after about three months of persuading and development and whatnot, he said, okay, I think it's time. Let's contact people. And uh, that's when I got the opportunity to interview uh, a bunch of people at the Final Cut Pro 10 Creative Summit, which is an annual uh, event. It's actually happening this year in November uh, where the Final Cut community and people who want to learn Final Cut can get together in Cupertino and get to go meet some people at Apple. And it's a really fun thing. So that was 2016 that I finally got the ball rolling. And that's, you know, that's why I did it. I wanted, I, you know, I wanted to uh, let people know who I am as a filmmaker and, and get in on this uh, movement. So you decided to make the film and you made a few connections as you started to approach people. What was their reaction to it? Were they anxious to tell their story? Were at that point in time, were they a little hesitant to endorse final cut pro as being quote unquote legitimate? Well, the people I was approaching specifically are uh, pretty fanatical about promoting Final Cut Pro 10 already. And some of them are software trainers or plugin developers. So understandably, you know, they, you know, the more people that hear Final Cut Pro 10 is great. That's the more customers for them. But also there were editors and other people who just love the tool so much that they weren't afraid to share it. But uh, I think they saw this as a great opportunity to kind of get, get their, add their voice to the message that we were trying to share. And and also, though, take a realistic look at, you know, take a hard look at, well, what did Apple really do wrong? Because this is a very interesting uh, case study in what happens, what does Apple do when they, when they get something wrong? And in the case of Final Cut Pro 10, I don't think the product was wrong. I just think the timing and the way they rolled it out was wrong. And that's something that everybody was really enthusiastic and eager to talk about. So I didn't have any initial hesitation from that community of people specifically, um, as I started reaching out to more people, uh, there was there may have been some nervousness and and, uh, and and being interviewed. For example, one one the person I actually ended up connecting with that really added a ton of credibility and legitimacy to this documentary was Randy Ubilos, who I mentioned earlier, and um, just through a random Facebook connection, he found out about the documentary and sent me his email address. And so we started corresponding and he agreed to let me go interview him. But he was, you know, he was like, is this going to be um, ultimately a positive message for Final Cut Pro 10? And I said, yes, I'm not trying to make a, an advertisement strictly. It's going to be a documentary, but Final Cut Pro 10, I love the software and that's a message I want to get out there. Um, and he said, no, I understand. That's, that's, fine, uh, let's, let's do the interview. And, um, and then when I interviewed, after I interviewed him, somebody who I didn't get to interview on camera, unfortunately, was a man by the name of Richard Townhill. And Richard Townhill was the product manager for Final Cut Pro 10. Um, in fact, I think he was in charge of all the video applications at Apple when Final Cut Pro 10 rolled out. So if there's one person, you know, to like point fingers at and to take the burden of, of <laughs> of this uh, you know terrible rollout, well, it might fall on Richard Townhill's shoulders, and uh, and I did have a phone conversation with him. He was down for the interview um, initially, but uh, he he's a busy guy. He works for Cisco now. He left Apple in 2015 around the same time Randy did, and uh, and 
we just, I went, I drove out to California and it just didn't end up happening, unfortunately, but it was interesting to talk to him on the phone and, and he was like, he, he owned it. He said, it was my mistake, but he's like, but I'm not going to apologize for the product. I, I stand by it and I believe in the product. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not going to name drop here, but you've got so many well-known people in the final cut community and the, and the, the filmmaking community, the digital filmmaking community. Um, so many people I know and, and, and recognized when you were showing the clips, it's like, wow, you know, this, this clearly, this set, this looks like a labor of love, not just from you, but also from the people who participated because they did want to tell their stories and they're part of it and, and why they made some of their decisions. Yeah, that's very true. And in fact, um, a lot of them too, after we shot the interviews and, and after I interviewed Randy, I launched a Kickstarter and, and I had uh, people actually put in money. Um, you can, if you go to my website, off the tracks, movie.com, you can see all the sponsors that we had and you'll, you might recognize like Philip Hodgetts or other people that, uh, that their companies actually put in some money on the Kickstarter. So there's definitely a whole movement behind, you know, sharing this message um, of, Hey guys, Final Cut Pro 10 is not what you think. If you think it's really bad software, you should really check it out because it's really powerful and it, and it can do the things that you say it can't do. <laughs> that's, that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to share. It's, it's really interesting because we see it happen in some other categories of software, but I think video, video software is especially true with it, that there's a passion with it. There's, there's a, you're a premier guy, I'm a final cut guy. And so that may not make us quite black and white, um, but you know, it's, it's, there, there's some gray in there. But, you know, there's, there's a definite love for some of these NLEs, and I don't quite know why, but I also find myself taking that position a little bit. It's like I look at Premiere, and it's like, okay, I, I, I've, I've worked with it some. Um, it just, for me, it doesn't seem quite as elegant. Um, I've played with some of the others. They, some others seem very elegant, but Final Cut just, just fits me. And I don't know if that's just in the, the nature of what I do with it, but it, I get the sense from talking to other people that that's sort of the way that they feel too. Yeah, I definitely think in the case of Final Cut Pro 10, um, because in the high-end professional space, it's it's the outlier, it's the underdog, that we get a little more defensive and passionate about it than people do about other tools. Um, just because, you know, it's it's not the number one used tool in Hollywood. The number one used tool in Hollywood is Avid. Um, but obviously there's a ton of people using Final Cut Pro 10 as well. They just, they're just using it in so many different ways. I think one reason why we get so attached to tools, and there's definitely with the classic Final Cut Pro, there's a lot of people who, you know, that's why they were so upset about Final Cut Pro 10 is because there wasn't any sort of eulogy or, you know, when, when Steve Jobs did the, uh, uh, you remember the Mac, when Mac OS 10 came, was out and Steve Jobs finally, he did like a funeral service for a mock funeral service for Mac OS 9. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> we, we didn't get that with Final Cut Pro 7. <laughs> <laughs> we probably needed that for those of us who are very passionate about it. Um, I think to more to your point, I think the reason why we get so attached to the tools is because a lot of us were so passionate about what we create and the tools we use are kind of infused into that in some way, the emotion, you know, of the stories we're trying to tell is it's somehow in, in the tool um, because it's it's the thing that liberates us, the thing that allows us to get that story out there. So I, I believe that's that's a big part of why. And then with Final Cut 10 and specifically, and if when you watch my documentary, you, you'll you'll see this. There was actually a lot of extra love, that extra Apple love and care and design put into it, design considerations put into Final Cut Pro 10 that um, you know. Adobe engineers and other people may not be given the luxury to spend months on a specific thing just because it feels better to do it this way. 
And and with Final Cut Pro 10, that's an argument at Apple you they could make is no, it feels better. Oh, okay, you can spend another two months on that feature <laughs> and get it just right. And for me, that translates to um, you know my everyday working experience being more joyful. It's a weird thing to say, but I, I'm happier when I use the software. And uh, and I actually took on some jobs uh, on Premiere, and I have nothing against, you know, learning other tools and 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 using them for work. But I have to say that my mood is less pleasant when I'm in other software, and and that's just it's one of those things I even at first don't even realize, and after a couple hours, I'm like, wow, I'm just not as happy. So <laughs> I don't know. There's, it's, it's, you know, and editors are emotional people. So <laughs> that's probably another part of it. <laughs> well, no, I, I understand that. Um, and it's funny that we're having this conversation now because I'm being, I, I'm having to make a transition from one piece of software to another. It has nothing to do with video editing. And my mood is not where it should be at the end of the day because I feel like what I'm having to move to is is inferior it's inferior mm. in design it's not well thought out um it, it it does not promote a workflow and as a result you know i just i don't like using it i have to use it um not only to not only because it's mandated but also because i have to get things done with it but it just doesn't have that that feel and so i i understand exactly what you're what you mean because to sit, if i sit down and work at a final cut project i I'm having a good time. You know, it's it's fun to see see the software perform, and I'm sure you can make it perform at levels I can't even dream of. But it performs for me just fine. You know, it sits up, rolls over, does what I want it to do. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you you end up smiling at it. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but I do understand. Yeah, and it's one of those things you tell people who, especially. You t- talked about um, earlier how you didn't necessarily have a lot of preconceived notions, or you didn't have to unlearn things. But for those editors who are stuck in the track-based paradigm of how editing software, everything really, but Final Cut Pro ten and now I guess Premiere Rush work, um, they they actually have a really hard time with the magnetic timeline because it doesn't behave the way they expect and the way that they've grown accustomed to. But on the flip side, you take any high school kid and you show them Final Cut Pro 10 and they're up and running, you know, really quickly, like within less than an hour, they're able to do what they need to do. That doesn't mean that they've even begun to, you know, grasp the depth of the application, but they're able to do what they need to do with it. Whereas um, the trainers and, and teachers I've talked to say that Final Cut Classic and Adobe Premiere, it takes them two weeks to teach the same, you know, to get them to the same point because it's just the software in so many ways gets in the way. Now, if you're, if you've taken that time to learn an older system, um, you know, you don't have to, you're, you're already comfortable with it. But uh, I think Final Cut Pro 10, if, if you're, if, if for those people that are able to kind of tilt their head or bend their mind a little bit, and see things from this other point of view. Once they're up and running in Final Cut Pro 10, I I believe they end up saving. But I know from my personal experience, I save so much time uh, editing in Final Cut Pro 10, and that also makes me happier that I'm able to get the same work done in in less time, and I get to go home earlier, and I'm not you know up till 2 a.m. you know dealing with bugs and problems. And you know I, I get it done. I you know, made this feature length documentary uh, largely by myself. I had a couple of people helping me edit and, and some other things. And uh, it was, you know, it was a big project to take on and I never had really any hiccups or major problems and I didn't lose sleep. So that says a lot to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that does say a lot. I know how these things go that, you know, word starts to get out. Uh, that you're, you know, there's there's this documentary in the making. Did you have any contact from Apple or with Apple during the uh, the production of it? Well, so I met people that work at Apple um, at the Creative Summit in 2016 because uh, they're act- they're there and they're actually at NAB as well. 
So I've met people who are engineers and designers and marketing people for Apple. Obviously, um, the way Apple works is they're very much controlled from the top, like their messaging and whatnot. So they don't want a specific person to necessarily be a voice for Apple unless they're pre-authorized or whatnot. But it was interesting to have private conversations with them about the tool. There was definitely a lot of interest in what I was doing. There was some apprehension to, <laughs> to you know, <laughs> what is this guy? You know, because they're so used to the bad press, right? And, 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 and one of the other things that was pointed out to me is even when a site will point out that, um, you know, they'll point out, they'll talk about the launch and how bad that went. It, the, the articles, and then they might highlight some new features in Final Cut Pro 10. And at the end, they, they usually just say, so, you know, it's starting to get good or it's, it's okay now. And I don't think the Apple marketing team for Final Cut really wants that to be the message. And um, not that I'm trying to be their spokesperson, um, but I do believe that there is something special and unique about Final Cut Pro 10. These are all tools, DaVinci Resolve, Premiere Pro, Avid. You can get, you can get to your destination with all of them, and they, they all have pros and cons. They all have things that are great about them and things that aren't so great about them, including Final Cut Pro Ten. But it is a unique piece of software, and like Apple kind of does, they're trying to be different with it. And so that's something that I'm trying to get out there, not necessarily that these other tools are bad, but that Final Cut Pro 10 is unique. And um, anyway, so back to the, the Apple people <laughs> that I've met. Uh, since it's, it's come out, you know, they, they haven't sponsored it. They're, they actually refuse to endorse or sponsor it, which is, I think, a good thing because it shows that the film was made by me independently of them. Um, but uh, internally, I think there's uh, my communications with them are positive. I'll put it that way. So, so you haven't been banned from the spaceship, in other words. I yep, I'm going to the Creative Summit again this year. They, you know, I'm being allowed to give away copies um, to everybody oh. who goes to the Creative Summit gets a free copy of my movie. So, <laughs> so I, obviously they're not against it, but they're um, and Apple does, you know, they they sponsor that event. They don't sponsor my movie. Uh, but obviously they they are encouraging in that way. But yeah, no official endorsement is going to come. You're not going to see a tweet from Tim Cook saying, go see this movie. I don't think I'd love that, but it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So what, what's the biggest surprise that happened along the way, whether it was who you got to talk to or what somebody said or a story that was told. And obviously we don't re reveal any confidences, but you know, it was there something that just stands out in your mind as one or maybe even two special moments uh, that, that, where things started to make sense or you came to understand things a little bit more? You know, it's, I mentioned earlier interviewing Randy. Um, that was just something that felt like it was out of the blue for months. People have been saying, you got to interview Randy. You know, he retired in 2015. So he, you know, he's, a, he's around and he's, I'm like, yeah, well, I know he's traveling the world, but I don't know how to get a hold of him. So the fact that that actually happened and I got to interview him and, and now, um, you know, I, in May, uh, my wife and I got to go have lunch with him. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, that's amazing um, in and of itself. I think one of the more unique finds for me was a, a guy by the name of Dave Cerf. Um, and his story was really interesting. Uh, Dave was a interface designer between 2009 and 2011 for Final Cut Pro 10. He actually left uh, Apple before the launch of Final Cut Pro 10, because he had an opportunity to be Walter Murch's assistant editor. So, you know, he's like, hey, I want to, I've, that's what he wanted to do is work on, on motion pictures. So he left Apple. He got a front row seat to Walter Murch's not so happy reaction to the initial launch <laughs> of Final Cut Pro 10. Um, but he also, as far as for interviewing him for the documentary, he had wonderful insights into what they were thinking when they were designing the magnetic timeline and designing Final Cut Pro 10 and how it would behave because that was specifically his job. So I, I feel like that was, you know, when I was able to add him to the documentary, 
Um, and that was actually really late in the game that I interviewed him. In fact, I'd already shown a full rough cut presentation preview. Uh, and then the next day I went and interviewed Dave Surf. Um, that was really amazing. And then another, uh, I think the last one I chair is a, a guy by the name of Michael Cioni. Um, was uh, he's he's the uh, senior vice president of innovation at Panavision slash Lightiron, and he's somebody that I've looked up to for years as a forward thinking person in digital cinema, and he's and I think he's actually pushing digital cinema further than really anybody else in Hollywood, and he's also a fan of Final Cut Pro Ten, and uh, when I when I reached out to him, I was asking specifically if I could inter- if I could use clips of things he had said at um, Lassie Pug meetings and other things, and uh, and use them in my documentary. And he said, "Well, I'll give you permission to do that, but um, I'd really like you to come interview me." And since interviewing Michael Cioni, he's been a huge supporter and and. Uh, and even his company Lightiron actually in cooperation with LumaForge and Frame.io uh, sponsored a screening of my movie in New York two weeks ago. So the, the those kinds of things are really amazing. Just knowing that I kind of started with very limited resources and contacts. And as I've been moving forward and, and more and more, and like you mentioned, I, I, uh, one another highlight was getting to speak on the super meat stage. So I don't know. There's a lot of, there's been a lot of developments and a lot of things that I'm really grateful for that have positive things that have come out of making the documentary. Well, you're definitely a great spokesman for the concept of, of using final cut and, and for the filmmaking community. And, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. I, I want to wrap up by going just a little bit geek on, on you. Um, okay. and asking what what did you what what gear did you use i mean because that's going to be something everybody wants to know obviously you cut it in final cut but what what kind of cameras did you use anything in any particular gear that uh gave it the look it has <laughs> yeah i uh i primarily shot on a black magic cinema camera the first version that came out um how many years ago was that 2013 i think is when that one came out and I also shot a little bit on the Red Raven, which is the is Red's 4.6K uh, kind of entry-level camera. And uh, I rented a C300 Mark II for, for some of the interviews as well. Um, but I'd say most of it's shot on the Blackmagic camera. A lot of the B-roll is. And I also got footage from... Uh, uh, that was one of the fun things is I reached out to the Final Cut community. And for some people who I wasn't able to go interview... They shot their own interviews and sent me footage and sent me B-roll. And uh, and so in a way, it is kind of a community film. I mentioned earlier that I did a lot of it by myself, but I also had an online community of people that contributed in a lot of ways. Uh, um, as far as lighting, I used uh, a couple lights. They're Westcott LED flex lights that are really, really cool. If you want to look those up on B&H Photo. Um, I mostly used, I shot my interviews on the Sigma 50 millimeter, uh, art lens, the 1.4, uh, f-stop lens. That's just gorgeous. So if you're talking about where the look came from, I think, I think more than anything, that lens and the lights probably contributed to the, the look. And I was really actually happy with how it looked up on a, um, on the 4k digital cinema projection screen at uh, this theater in New York. Uh, I think it held up really, really well, even though I finished my documentary in 1080, it still just had a nice crisp and clean look to it. So yeah, that's mostly, I think that's pretty much all the gear. <laughs> I, I love the fact that the, the, the community, you know, rose up to, to adopt this and, you know, contribute, obviously you're the guy that called the shots, but, you know, that they were willing to do some of that stuff. They wanted to be part of it. Um, it, it once again, it just speaks so much to the, the power of the community that surrounds this particular piece of software and around Apple itself. Yeah, I would totally agree. There's, I mean, people are passionate about Apple and, and Final Cut in ways that I, I don't see people being as passionate about 
HP or any other <laughs> manufacturer. You don't see them really getting having that emotional attachment. It, it probably just speaks to the the love and care that's put into the the products that Apple puts out. Yeah, if folks, if if you understand that, then you get it, and you're one of us. And if you don't, then we kind of feel sorry for you, and we'd love to try to explain it to you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just is the way it is. Um, Brad, so let's now we've done a lot of talking about it. Let's tell folks where they can go and how they can watch it or get it. All right. So um, off the tracks movie.com is my website. And right on the main page, there's links to buy it from iTunes, uh, buy or rent from iTunes, Amazon. Um, and it's also on VHX. Uh, the nice thing about VHX.tv is. I'm able to provide it worldwide, whereas iTunes, I'm somewhat limited and I have to pay to add to extra territories and whatnot. Um, but on Amazon, it's available uh, in the UK and the US. And on iTunes, it's actually available in a lot of uh, English-speaking territories, not Australia for some reason, but I'm looking into it. And VHX everywhere in the world. So yeah, offthetracksmovie.com. Perfect. Folks, go check it out. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating study, I think, in, in something that you may not have realized some of the controversy that was going on at the time, but there was quite a controversy. And just as Brad said, you know, there's some lessons here to be learned from the, the rollout, but there's also just a feel that is consistent with so many other things in the Apple community that, you know, it's, it's something positive and you really, I promise you, you will enjoy it. Brad, thank you. Um, you. You did the off the tracks movie dot com. Uh, other places where they might find you on social media or any other projects going on. Uh, I'm currently developing some ideas for for future projects. I definitely want to leverage what I've done with off the tracks to advance my career, which is another reason why I made it. Uh, but uh, I mean, you can find you can find uh, off the tracks on on uh, Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, I post pretty regularly to there. And I'm in a lot of the Final Cut user groups, groups and forums uh, that are on Facebook as well. So if you're, if you're a fan of Final Cut and you're in the Final Cut Pro 10 editors group, then pro you've probably seen me post something there or reply to a comment or something because I'm pretty active on that community. So you're not hard to find if somebody wants to pitch an idea or ask a question about about the film. No, in fact, if you email, if you go to the contact page on offthetrucksmovie.com and you email that, those emails go directly to me and I'm the only one who replies to them. So Great. Um, not hard to find me. <laughs> Thank you again for the time. This has been a real pleasure. I, I've, I look forward to enjoying the movie again with a little more information now that I have some of the backstory. I think it'll, it'll make it even more special, but appreciate all your efforts and, and your time for being here. All right. Thank you. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Again, go, go check this out. I think you will really enjoy it. It's something a little bit different, but if you have an even, even the smallest interest in video editing, I think you're going to find it fascinating. And if you have any interest at all in Apple, I think you will definitely find it fascinating. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Mac Voices Facebook group and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices magazine, free on Flipboard. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us at patreon.com slash macvoices and join these folks who help keep Mac Voices coming to you. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.